Okay, welcome back to our last section in today's symposium. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce our next earlier career scientist speaker, Dr. Wana Karja. She's currently a postdoc working with Dr. Joshua Parkin in UPenn. Before that, he did his undergrad with mathematics major, and then he went to Stanford to do her PhD work with Dr. Marcus Feldman. Dr. Karja has been published a lot of papers emphasizing the importance of using the theory in answering evolutionary questions. The work she has been doing, including modeling the evolution uh, happening in fluctuated environments, as well as the evolution considering the dividing popu subdivided populations. Also, in her simulation, not only genetic factors are considered, she also considered those epigenetic impacts on her theory. She's been very thoughtful for thinking about how theory could be used in this area. And I personally had a very interesting conversation earlier talking about how theory can be used and should be used in biology. Okay, so today he's, he's go, uh, she's going to share us with her recent topic about the selective advantage of phenotypic plasticity. That's welcome, Dr. Karja. Um, thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me and offering me the chance to speak about some of my favorite things in the world. Um, also, this talk is going to be a little bit different than previous talks. It's going to be a purely modeling theoretical talk. And so um, feel free to interrupt me at any time and ask questions whenever something isn't clear. So I would really appreciate that. So. I want to start with this quote that I really love from this review in 2006 because it really frames some of the questions and directions of my work ever since I started my PhD and now sort of all the way into my postdoc. And this says that the world inhabited by bacteria and other microorganisms is perilous. These tiny creatures must cope with the vicissitudes of an environment that undergoes perpetual alterations, perpetual changes be it in temperature, salinity, nutrients, antibiotics or other drugs, mutagens, radiation, and so on. So you have environmental variations that are commonplace, yet unpredictable across biological systems, across very diverse biological systems, in fact. And um, we want to know how do populations survive this environment? How do they manage to persist and keep, one, keep one's footing on this ever-changing landscape? A lot of the times, especially in population genetic models, we have this framework of fitness pushing you towards the fitness peak in the static fitness landscape. However, what happens when the landscape changes through time? Can organisms prepare for this kind of environmental stochasticity? And can evolution prepare organisms prepare populations, lineages, for the stochasticity. And um, there are many different strategies, it turns out, surprisingly. No, not really. Um, there's many different strategies that um, organisms um, can employ to survive this commonplace um, and unpredictable changes in environment. Some of them had to do with increasing genetic diversity. Um, either through increasing mutation rates, through combination rates, migration rates, and I look at some of those mechanisms um, in uh, some of my work. But today I want to talk to you about a particular type of uh, mechanism that has to do with increasing phenotypic diversity. So sort of this type of evolutionary bed hedging by which you increase diversity, um, as Bernoulli so uh, rightfully put in 1738, um, you know, increase diversity so that maybe some of the individuals survive and you don't get to risk them all together when um, the environment changes through time. And um, I love um, this um, 
little image that shows um, these two different organisms, the exact same genotypes, um, these wrinkled and smooth uh, pseudomonas lines, however, very different genotypes. Um, and you see this type of environmental bed hedging as um, an adaptive strategy across many different systems. So for example, in the malaria parasite, researchers have found out that if you um, subject these parasites to these periodic changes in environment that are meant to mimic uh, febrile episodes in a patient, for example, the more transcriptionally diverse lines survive these types of heat shock fluctuations better than the less diverse lines. And in fact, this type of phenotypic variance as evolutionary strategy has been uh, hypothesized for many different kinds of mechanisms and systems. So um, some people have proposed that latency um, in different viral populations can be viewed as a type um, of phenotypic bed hedging mechanism. Um, drug tolerance states in um, cancer um, subpopulations whereby um, some subpopulations of cells um, in different types of tumors exhibit um, decreased sensitivity to drugs. Um, and one of my favorite examples is bacterial persistence. Um, again, the same type of mechanism where you have subpopulations um, of individuals that are either um, less resistant or, or completely resistant to drugs. And um, all of the, uh, um, and this is another um, sort of example from a recent um, paper that came out um, a few months ago showing that um, treated with a certain antimicrobial that's actually triclosan, that's actually um, used in many household products today, um, researchers have found um, thousandfold higher frequency of persisters um, than in untreated populations. So, um, you know, bacterial persistence could actually be a, a health risk um, overall. Um, and what all these systems have in common, and what we generally try to do when we try to understand something analytically and begin modeling one of these, um, uh, one of these phenomena is to try to sort of find commonalities between all these different systems. So one thing that they have in common is that you, you find over and over again these genetically identical populations with two or more available phenotypes, each one better in one of the environmental conditions. So for example, drug and no drug in the case of persistent bacteria. These phenotypic states are partially heritable uh, by offspring cells. And these rates of change, these phenotypic rates of change, generally tend to be higher than the rates of genetic mutation. Um, this rate of phenotypic mutation itself might be under genetic control. And overall, by tuning these rates of phenotypic mutations, so the rates at which uh, variability is produced, these populations may increase um, their long-term adaptability. And so one of the, the big questions I've been interested in is, what is the evolutionary advantage of these types of stochastically uh, changing uh, alleles, so phenotypically plastic alleles in a way? Um, and one way to model it is to say, okay, let's say we have a population of um, wild-type individuals. These individuals do not have the plastic phenotype. And let's say that we now introduce one different allele, either by, let's say, a genetic mutation um, in the population. Um, and this different allele confers a certain phenotypic range um, so this, phenotyp this, this new allele has access to a, to a larger phenotypic range than the wild type individual. So you have these two different types of genotypes and you have two different random variables uh, for their phenotypic ranges. Um, and for now, we'll assume that this is a fixed number um, and this is a random variable. Um, and then, in order to understand this type of evolutionary advantage of these phenotypically plastic alleles, we ask, starting from this one copy in the population, what is the fixation probability of an allele that confers this phenotypic, um, phenotypic range? 
Um, and there's many other alternative uh, ways to sort of phrase models like this and also apply them to other questions. Um, for example, you can um, think of um, this um, big A versus small A allele as an allele that controls variation in regulatory function at another locus or so on, but um, I'm not gonna dwell on that. And um, so another thing that we saw is essentially in these models is the fact that we have this rate of phenotypic memory or alternatively phenotypic mutation. So with uh, probability P, we assume that um, the offspring inherits uh, the parent's phenotype and with probability one minus P, the offspring redraws from the entire phenotypic distribution. And um, this type of parent, um, this type of partially heritable phenotype confers um, a parent offspring correlation somewhere between sort of full genetic encoding and the type of uh, plasticity um, in um, where um, sort of the more traditional type of plasticity looking at norms of reaction um, and um, sort of uh, quantitative genetic traits. Um, and in order to simulate changing environments, uh, we also assume that there are two environmental conditions. So you have, for example, an environment with no drug and an environment with drug. Uh, we assume that um, the persister phenotype, um, the plastic phenotype does better in the environment with um, no drug, let's say in one of the environments, whereas the other allele um, does better in the other environment. But across environments, we keep the means of the two alleles the same, so as to really focus on the role of variance. So across environments, the arithmetic means of the two alleles are the same, and then we simply uh, uh, periodically um, change the environments through time. We also uh, play around with different types of, uh, of um, changes through time that are not periodic. However, I'm only gonna focus on the periodic fluctuations in this talk. So what do we see? Um, so here I'm plotting this phenotypic memory, so this partial heritability on the x-axis, and I'm plotting the probability of fixation of the A allele on the y-axis for a range of environmental durations. I don't see my little pointer anymore, but that's fine. For a range of environmental durations. And what we see is that there is an intermediate optimum for phenotypic memory that maximizes this probability of fixation for the A allele. And this phenotypic optimum, and this optimum um, depends crucially on um, the um, uh, rate of um, um, environmental change. So how long you stay in an environment before you have to change environment. Um, and this is actually not surprising. So I've only mentioned sort of um, some of the things we've been playing around, but this is actually a really, um, uh, a, a really fruitful field. So a field that has seen a lot of work uh, under different types of frameworks, starting from this paper by Ishii in 1989, Lachman and Jablonka, all of them trying to understand sort of either through a framework of evolution of mutation rates or evolution of stochastic switching, trying to sort of understand these genetic strategies of, of bedheading. And what they see is that um, as a function of the environmental period, the evolutionary stable switching rate generally evolves to be around one over N. So basically, what this means is that you kind of want to, to uh, mimic the rate at which your environment changes. So you're sort of, you want to switch phenotypes sort of at the same rate at which the environment changes. And this is exactly what we see here too in this completely different framework. So before, um, some of, most of these things have been studied from this framework of infinite population sizes. Here we have a constant population um, size and looking at this framework, different framework of probabilities of fixation. And again, we see this type of uh, mimicking, this type of um, ev the evolutionary stable strategy that confers the highest benefit and is optimal um, across, these, um, ac across these different types of simulations is, um, is the one that sort of mimics um, the, the rate of environmental change. And this, is, this slide is only for people sort of a little bit more in the know about this. So 
um, and I'm going to stop at it very briefly, what it turns out that what you're really trying to maximize here is the geometric mean fitness. So the, the phenotypic memory that uh, maximizes the probability of fixation um, is the phenotypic memory that maximizes geometric mean fitness at stationary distribution for the A allele. And that is sort of the link between these, all these different frameworks, be it in an infinite population or a finite population size. This is really the intuitive link that drives um, all these results. So I've talked about sort of what happens in infinite populations or populations of fixed size, but as Maynard Smith um, so rightly put it in 1989, adaptation in threatened populations, so populations that have a certain probability of going extinct, isn't like ordinary adaptation. It's actually a, get, a race against extinction. And um, uh, there's been a lot of work done in this framework of um, evolutionary rescue, either by um, the people in the field of conservation biology trying to preserve a species diversity, or people uh, more interested in the opposite goal of medical eradication. So we wanted to see what happens if now we have a population um, that of, of individuals um, that instead of having a fixed population size can now have this probability of going extinct. So we start, we always start with this population of individuals that um, have a death rate that's higher than its birth rate. So we know that to start with, the uh, population that's fixed on the wild type would go extinct. And now we ask, okay, what happens if in this population we introduce, same as before, one individual that has access to a wider range of phenotypes, has this um, type of um, you know, phenotypic memory between generations, this probability of phenotypic memory. Um, and so now the model is framed in terms of birth rates and death rates. Um, and um, here N is the changing population size and K is the carrying capacity of the population. Um, and I only have a tiny bit of math. Um, I don't, I almost thought of not including this slide, but I really think that it provides a lot of intuition. The analytics here provides intuition into what's happening. So I want to just very briefly mention um, the analytic approach that we did and to deconstruct it a little bit. So let's say that we introduce, let's say that instead of having this more complicated model of random variables as phenotypes, let's say we have uh, the small A allele only have access only has access to two different phenotypes. A phenotype that's less, like that's worse than uh, the phenotype of, of big A and a phenotype that's better. So it has access to two, these two different phenotypes with a certain phenotypic mutation rate between them. And um, this is all selected such that the uh, mean sort of, if this was um, viewed as a distribution, the mean of this distribution would be equal to the mean of the wild type. So that's why the wild type would be somewhere here in the middle. Um, so let's say we only introduce the small a allele starting with this much better phenotype, the phenotype that's better than the wild type. Um, it turns out that we can quickly model this by looking, by assuming that the population of small a quickly reaches a type of mutation selection balance, we can then get a, a select, an effective selecting coefficient for the small a population. And that effective selective coefficient tells us really all we need to know about the probability of evolutionary <coughs> rescue. So if here we plot the phenotypic memory just like before on the x-axis, and we plot the probability of evolutionary rescue on the y-axis for different types of variants of the A allele, what we see is that if we always start on the beneficial phenotype, you always do better when you have higher phenotypic memory. And this is super intuitive. If you always start on the beneficial phenotype, phenotypic memory of essentially one is always the best because you always don't want to switch to a worse phenotype. You always want to keep this phenotype in the population and have it reproduce. What happens now if we start with um, both with, um, um, so, so 
Here, this simulation, in this simulation, you have the wild type individuals, this pink, and then you have the um, individuals, um, the A allele in green, and the, the size of the circles represents the different sort of fitness or birth rates for the, for the two different alleles. So what we see here is that memory really confers a benefit, confers a, a selective advantage to these types of high fitness individuals. They're selected for reproduction, and then memory allows them to stay high fitness instead of being resampled from the entire phenotypic distribution. And memory doesn't really have that much of an effect on the low fitness individuals. Now, what happens if instead of always introducing the, the mutant uh, with the beneficial phenotype, we introduce it with the deleterious phenotype? Well, it turns out that analytically, we can again model this very quickly by modeling the probability that this allele, this, uh, this allele switches its phenotype to the advantageous phenotype before loss of the allele from the population. So remember, you have this type of stochastic, you know, stochastic process, genetic drift is at play here. So what is the probability that I actually get to a better phenotype before I lose the allele? And what we see in this case is that uh, phenotypic, again, this, um, you, you recapture these types of results where there's an intermediate amount of phenotypic memory that um, increases the probability of, of evolutionary rescue. And this, again, is intuitive. You do not want perfect memory in this case because you want to be able to switch to a better phenotype before you lose this, this new lineage from the population. However, you don't want phenotypic memory that is too low because, again, this does not help the high fitness individuals. So um, this was all in the case of populations that undergo one major change in environment, for example, introduction of drugs under which the population would go extinct. What happens if we, again, um, try to model this type of changing environment um, in these populations of changing size. Um, and in this framework, um, we know, um, you know the expectations that that populations will go extinct. So that here we don't look at the probability of, of, of rescue, but instead we measure times to extinction as a function, again, of this parameter that we're interested in, of this type of partial heritability between generations. And again, we recapture the same results um, that depend on the duration in the environment where um, the, the, the time to extinction um, is maximized by an intermediate value of this, um, this phenotypic memory. Um, so to sum up, we find that there is an optimum phenotypic memory that maximizes um, all, these, all these different kinds of measures of, of, of adapt, uh, how, how, how well you do in these types of changing environments, measures of fitness in a way. So the uh, probability, you know, the probability of fixation, the evolutionary stable rate in, for infinite populations, the probability of evolutionary rescue, times to extinction, and so on. Um, and I don't know, how much time do I have? Six and a half minutes, okay. So I'm going to very quickly try to rush through and present. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and present some, um, some of the newer directions in which we're taking um, this work. Um, and this is all kind of sort of very new and unpolished, but I really wanted to, to in, in, include here uh, regardless because I want feedback on it. Um, so lately we've been very interested in trying to understand um, the effects of spatial structure in these types of um, um, in these types of systems, and trying to understand, especially you know, the role of spatial structure on evolutionary outcome, um, the role in uh, in the persistence of these of these populations, and uh, we've uh, we've been very interested in it, especially because there's more and more data that is coming out um, that has. Uh, better and better spatial resolution. Um, and we can better map these types of spatial differences and spatial distributions. Um, and the reason we're interested in it is because um, 
environments that change through space can lead to different evolutionary dynamics that environments that change through time. So if you have a change through time like we had before, all the population experiences that change in selection. However, for environments that change through space, only the migrants or only local individuals, a much smaller number of individuals, experience that change in selection. And so the evolutionary dynamics, um, and as we saw in sort of some previous work um, that I did looking at just two deem um, um, sort of type of models with migration between them, the evolutionary dynamics can be strikingly different. Um, and sort of one of the reasons I got interested in this is because there seems to be um, sort of more and more hypothesizing um, about the role of these uh, quiescent populations um, in, uh, for example, in tumors, um, in metastases, and so on, quiescent populations that may be less sensitive or even resistant to standard therapy. Um, however, um, they're not genetic, they do not um, give an individual's genetic resistance. They have been shown to be able to switch back to their original form. Um, and it's hypothesized that um, some of um, you know, the, the, the evolutionary benefit of this is that maybe this type of um, phenotypic variance here can increase sort of the, the probability that the, the uh, uh, population persists until more permanent genetic strategies may be found, such as a genetic mutation. Um, so the way we um, are attempting to um, attack this problem of trying to understand um, the role of uh, spatial distribution and evolutionary outcome is to play with evolutionary dynamics on uh, different types of spatial structures um, and sort of play with the Moran process essentially on graphs. So here you have all these different kinds of spatial structures. Um, Individuals are assumed to be uh, nodes in a graph, and um, um, we, assume, we, we uh, assume that one individual, so let's say one step of the Moran process is that we select an individual for death. Um, then we select an individual for reproduction among its neighbors, um, and this uh, birth selection process is proportional to fitness, and then, um, then this new individual replaces the one Proportion, uh, selected for death. And so here, the nodes are the individuals, and the links basically represent which individuals can replace my focal individual. And um, there's been some work trying to understand um, the, these types of evolutionary dynamics and Moran processes on graphs, but most of it has been done in this context of incredibly small, so here um, from a paper um, in 2015, n equals six, very regular types of graphs like stars or superstars or funnels and so on. Um, and so what we're trying to do is try to understand um, population dynamic and build these types of population genetic models on much larger um, sort of networks and also networks much more biologically relevant. So networks um, that we can get from data and um, networks that don't have these very regular types of properties. Um, and so just to start, um, we use um, scale-free networks as a unifying framework where we vary um, the um, power of preferential attachment where you can go from purely random networks to networks um, of these types of winner-takes-all um, and uh, with networks with uh, incredibly uh, large hubs. And um, if, we, if we play with our uh, persistence model in, in, in this type of spatially uh, uh, explicit framework, uh, we find, again, the same type, qualitatively, the same type of, of, uh, of dynamics where uh, there is an intermediate phenotypic memory that um, uh, uh, increases the probability of fixation that leads to the highest probability of fixation. Um, and our goal in this work is to sort of try to understand properties, how, 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 how probabilities of fixation are also affected by properties and statistics of these networks. So for example, it turns out that 
increasing standard deviation and degree for this network decreases the probability of fixation. Um, and uh, we're looking at, it turns out that some of this dynamics is critically dependent in these spatial type of models, it's critically dependent on the degree of the initial node at which int you introduce the mutation. And we're trying to sort of do this systematic study of trying to understand probabilities of fixation for a wide array of models um, as a function of these networks. That's it, thank you. I guess we don't have time for questions, but I'm here all day, so. Thank you. Okay, so it's my honor to introduce the keynote speaker, Dr. Cameron Gallenberg, for our earlier career scientist symposium this year. So Dr. Gallenberg's research have been very diverse in the area of ecology and evolution, also including some behavioral study as well as touching some conservation issues. Even just focus on the topic we are focused on today, which is the phenotypic plasticity. He's also focused on very diverse the phenotypes as well as very diverse the organisms. So Dr. Gallenberg got his doctoral degree in University of Montana, where he studied the sexual related traits and the reproductive behavior of birds with advisor Dr. Thomas Martin. From there, he has already published several papers about the plasticity of such sex-related trait and behavior under different kinds of environmental variations. Later, he moved to University of California, Riverside, as a postdoc in Dr. David Resnick's lab, where that's where he started to study the evolution of guppy, especially focused on what kind of factor could constrain or facilitate the adaptive evolution. For example, from there, he has been working on a long-term experimental evolution of guppies in a wild setting, as well as perform related transcriptal analysis. The importance of this work was really highlighted by his recent published paper, which I believe he's going to talk about it today. The paper is really interviewing, uh, interviewing and very interesting and provocative in terms of it really test the role of non-adaptive non plasticity as well as the adaptive plasticity in the adaptive evolution. And the experimental setting is in a wild uh, environment setting. Besides that, besides all the research he has been doing, he also wrote many important review papers focused on important topics in this area including distinguishing adaptive versus non-adaptive plasticity, testing the role of different kinds of plasticity, as well as talking about the constraint and the cost of evolution of plasticity may face, which I found very important and helpful when I start to work on the uh, questions in this area. Besides that, he also has big contribution in the aspect of teaching and outreaching he 
involved in editing an advanced course orienting, oriented textbook on integrative organismal biology, as well as developing classroom activity worksheet on gene environment interaction using his GAPI system as example. And he also participated those outreach and teaching activities in the elementary school to the high school. So with all this important contribution in the field, today he's going to give us talk titled Does Phenotypic Plasticity Facilitate or Constrain the Adaptive Evolution? Let's welcome Dr. Gallenberg. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to, uh, to be here and, um, and talk after uh, so many great talks. I'm not sure if there's a lot to say. <laughs> um, we've heard a lot, about, uh, a lot about plasticity, and um, I think you'll find that a lot of what I'm going to say has already been said in, in various ways, but hopefully I'll have something to contribute. I also just want to really thank the, the the organizing committee for, for inviting me. Um, it, it is really a great honor to, to be up here. All right, so let's see, to start, there's been a, an increasing, I guess, appreciation, uh, particularly over the last few decades, that uh, adaptive evolution is, is not a, a process that is separate from what we would think of as, as eco ecology, and that adaptation occurs on ecological timescales. And I, I know that thinking back when I was in graduate school, um, if you use the term adaptation loosely, um, you sort of would get strange looks from people, like be careful how you say it, be careful the words you're using here. Um, yet at the same time, you know, there, there have been Many studies that have shown that adaptation occurs on a, on a very rapid time scale and is something that is easily documented. So the work of, for example, Yanis Antonovic showing the, the rapid evolution of heavy metal tolerance in, in plants, where we know the time of when these mine tailings were established, that plants quickly uh, um, colonized these environments, and showed a suite of genetically based adaptations in terms of dealing with heavy metal tolerance, in terms of dealing with uh, uh, water availability, et cetera. And in the time since, uh, the, the number of examples just continue to grow. I, I can change the slide, I think, next time based on some of the, the uh, talks I've seen today. Uh, but just to highlight some of this work, uh, Carol Lee, who works on these Eurytiroma uh, copepods, has shown uh, repeated colonization of freshwater environments from the marine uh, environment. In, into lakes and uh, quick changes in uh, osmoregulation, a uh, suite of other physiological traits. Work by Scott Carroll on soapberry bugs has shown that uh, insects have shifted their host plants to introduced ornamental trees within the past few decades, and in the process have evolved changes in morphology for feeding, changes in uh, their tolerance to host plant chemistry, the phenology of timing. And in invertebrates, examples like uh, colonization in uh, islands by Italian wall lizards and a switch to a, a more vegetarian diet has caused rapid evolutionary changes in the digestive system, the morphology of the digestive tract, and the, the enzymes that go along with it. One, one feature that all of these kinds of examples share is that they often um, occur within a context of populations colonizing new environments. And so, and I think that's a theme that, that we've heard a lot today. And so, um, it, and that's something that I'll, I'll continue to talk about now. Um, the other point that I want to make is that this, this idea that evolution occurs on an ecological time scale is really shifting our ideas um, on how evolution occurs. And I think this is a very exciting time for uh, those of us who are interested in evolutionary ecology, because the, the barriers uh, between the disciplines is becoming more um, fluid. And so, you know, when I took uh, an evolutionary biology class and I learned about adaptation, it was largely viewed in the context of a mutation-driven process over long time periods 
the fixation of those, those mutations um, over time. Uh, but there's increasing evidence that um, most, especially contemporary adaptation, uh, comes from standing genetic variation. And this is really changing, I think, the world view. There's a very nice review by Rowan Barrett and, and Dolph Schluter that uh, emphasize this, this shift over towards thinking about uh, standing genetic variation within populations. But the other aspect of when eco ecological and evolutionary time converge is a topic that's, that's come up today, which is that environments, new environments, play this dual role. They alter the distribution of phenotypes, and they also act as an agent of selection. And so I think our, our earlier talks today uh, used the, you know, showed a very variation on the same slide, which is that we know that genotypes interact with their environments to produce phenotypes. So you could imagine the effects of temperature during development that might alter the phenotype. But temperature, and especially if you move into, say, a, a new warm environment or a new cold environment, um, is also a source of selection. And so, so when you have this convergence of ecological and evolutionary time, uh, we really can't ignore how plasticity, how the environment is shifting the distribution of phenotypes, and how that shift in the distribution aligns with the kinds of evolutionary changes that um, are favored. Now, sometimes this type of plasticity is clearly adaptive. And I think these are the kinds of examples of plasticity that really capture our imagination. Um, sometimes this is uh, referred to as also as a, as a co-gradient pattern, where the direction of plasticity is in the same direction favored by evolution. Uh, this is actually something that Falconer talked about in an agricultural setting, uh, in breeding experiments, what he referred to as synergistic selection. And there's numerous examples. I've just highlighted a few up here. For example, <clears throat> if you look at anolis lizards that are uh, different ecotypes, different species that are adapted to uh, different substrates in species that occur on, for example, the side of trees and trunks, have short limbs that help them in terms of locomotion, uh, whereas those that live and run on the ground have longer limbs that help them to escape from predators. But if you take the long-limbed individuals and you have them develop on twigs and, and branches, they develop a morphology that's very similar to the ecotypes that occur on trunks. So here, the plastic response of developing on a certain substrate mimics and is in the same direction favored by, by evolution. Um, similar examples, for example, if you look at the gill morphology of fish, if you compare populations that are adapted to um, hypoxic conditions where there's low oxygen, they have these very expanded gill morphologies for taking up oxygen. But if you take a, a population that normally doesn't see those conditions and you have it develop under low oxygen conditions, it will develop that same type of morphology. And I could go on and on with other examples. So these, these, type of, these, are, the, these are the examples, again, that we would refer to as being very adaptive. And, and it's clear that, you know, natural selection is playing some role in this. But at the same time, there's lots of examples where the environment um, is something to be overcome. Uh, the environment induces changes that, are, that oppose the direction favored by natural selection. And again, Falconer referred to these examples as, as being antagonistic selection, where you're selecting in one, in, in one direction, but the environment is pushing you in an opposite direction. Uh, this is also what's referred to as counter-gradient selection in, in, in other examples. So uh, one of my favorite examples is, is this work on um, kokanee salmon. So these salmon uh, typically uh, are anadromous. They go out to the ocean. They feed on very carotenoid-rich foods. And the males come back bright red and use that red coloration to attract females. Now, occasionally, these salmon get landlocked. Um, and they become what, what are referred to as kokanee salmon. But in the, in the lake environments that they get trapped in, the, the carotenoid availability of their food is very, very limited. And so they, they eat the same food, but they can't produce the same red coloration. They're, they're actually green. 
at the time of breeding. And so you can, you can actually identify these, these recent landlocked individuals because they, they're, they're referred to as greenies. And over time, what's been documented is that these kokanee population evolved the ability to become red. And so if you look at them phenotypically, they look red just like their uh, anadromous ancestors. But if you put them, if you put these landlocked ones on a, and, a, and their wild ancestors on a low carotenoid diet, the ancestors can't produce the red, the kokanee can. So they've, they've evolved to go back to their sort of ancestral phenotype by becoming more efficient in their ability to take up carotenoids. So this, this is a, um, these, these examples of adaptation to maintain sort of the original phenotype um, are often sometimes referred to as cryptic evolutionary changes because they're not always obvious. This is certainly the case with these kinds of counter gradient examples where you look across uh, a temperature or an elevation uh, gradient and you don't see a lot of changes and, until you bring them into a common garden and then you see that these populations really are very, very different from one another. Um, Temperature is, I think, one of the best examples of this. So um, work by, for example, Ray Huey and colleagues have, have noted that in the absence of any kind of behavioral thermoregulation, if you put ectotherms in cold environments, they do poorly. They would prefer much warmer temperatures, uh, but the fact that they're ectotherms pushes them away from that optimum. And so they have to compensate either through behavioral thermoregulation or biochemical changes to deal with that. Um, in other cases, uh, suboptimal temperatures or conditions can just result in, in chaos. Um, so the work that's been done, for example, with he, uh, HSP90, the heat shock protein, uh, you mess with HSP90 and you uncover all of this cryptic genetic variation that, that, that um, persists in these populations. All of these examples are cases where organisms would like to buffer themselves from the environment. They don't want to be plastic. They want to maintain uh, some constant homeostatic state um, across a range of environments but that they have to deal with, with um, um, and they have to either evolve or uh, cope with these, these kind, this kind of variation. So, so we have these kind of contrasting views, but if we look just within a population, the other thing that we see is that within a population, not all genotypes respond in the same way. And so this is something pointed out earlier today that uh, what's common are these genotype by environment interactions. And another way to think about this is that there is genetic variation for plasticity within populations. Plasticity itself can evolve. So where does adaptive plasticity come from? It has to come from the standing genetic variation that exists uh, within the population. And so this then leads to sort of the, an interesting question, which is that if selection can act on the evolution of plasticity <clears throat> and plasticity itself can evolve, what role is this plasticity playing in adaptive evolution? And this is not a new question. This actually goes back to the time of Darwin. Um, many people who studied the effects of the environment on development, we're very interested in where this fit within the, the larger sort of evolutionary context. But I think we really need to give credit to Mary Jane West Eberhardt, who um, several years now ago uh, published a book where she, she really tried to make a, a, a forceful case for bringing plasticity back into um, our kind of conceptions of and, and framework for thinking about adaptive evolutionary change. And in particular, she, she, she argues you know, and asks, is, is plasticity an overlooked component that we're, we're completely ignoring in many of our theoretical and empirical uh, um, projects in quantifying adaptive evolution? And I think the follow-up question to that then is, if it is playing a role, what kind of role is it playing? And, and that's kind of what I want to talk about uh, today. And so what I, what I want to just kind of go over and review a little bit is, is a conceptual framework for thinking about how selection acts on variation and, 
um, results in, in an evolutionary response. I'll talk about guppies as a model system uh, using experimental evolution in nature to, to answer these kind of questions and talk about patterns of plasticity and evolution in, and, in trait correlations and how those affect morphology and behavior, and then end with talking about uh, a transcriptomic approach that looks at plasticity and evolution uh, by measuring gene expression. Okay, so same theory, different data. So if there's a lot of terms when you start to dive into the plasticity literature that many of you are already familiar with, like genetic assimilation, genetic accommodation. Um, but I think if we simplify things to, to the very basics, we can just kind of go back to the same statistical machinery that um, is used by quantitative geneticists to ask, how does selection act on a trait and result in a, in a, in a response? So this is the um, multivariate version of the breeder's equation. So we can just model the change in any trait, delta Z, as a function of the genetic variance covariance matrix. Um, so in, in simple speak, just how traits are correlated with one another and how strong selection acts directly on those traits and indirectly, so the selection differential. So I think the first question that I wanted to ask is, well, how does plasticity affect the two major terms of the model? How does, how does plasticity affect trait correlations and how does plasticity affect the strength of selection? Well, um, oftentimes we assume that these genetic correlations are stable over time. But just like the, her just like the terms like heritability are, are context dependent, trait correlations are also context dependent. And so we can visualize the patterns of covariance between traits, and we know that across different environments, uh, that the, the, the pattern of, of co covariance or correlation can, can change. It can result in more variation. You can go from having uh, some structure to, to no structure and no um, major axis that uh, biases the results. And so this has really important implications because if you consider sort of a scenario like this where let's say in, in blue we have essentially um, equal additive genetic covariance in, along both axes, trait one and trait two are free to evolve in, in any direction. But if a plastic response brings two traits more strongly into correlation with one another, um, it biases the, the direction of, of change, and, and that's what selection may actually end up seeing. Very few studies have actually taught, thought or um, tried to ask you know, how plasticity affects these, these types of, of correlations and what the evolutionary consequences are. In a, in a more network approach, we also know that if we look at either gene networks or protein networks, we also know that they are very plastic. They change in response to uh, different environments, and they're also under very strong stabilizing selection. And so this is another way of thinking about how different kinds of traits are correlated with one another. The, the structure of these networks biases um, how populations will evolve and, and the trajectory that they will take. So there's at least at, at some level some reason to expect that plasticity might play a role in changing uh, the way in which traits are correlated with one another. What about selection? So Anya talked about evolutionary rescue. I think that's a, a good framework for thinking about selection. So you can imagine a situation where you have a, a population at a local optima in its native environment, and then it has to evolve and become adapted to, to a new environment, some new environmental change. And um, in order to do that, we, we often think about populations having to go through this fitness valley of death <laughs> to get from, from one peak to another. Well, if, you, if a population exhibits adaptive plasticity where you move it from one environment to the other, what does that do to selection? That essentially smooths the, the, the surface, the fitness surface and weakens directional selection and can help populations potentially persist in these new environments and um, uh, avoid the cost of selection, the demographic cost of selection that would, 
um, otherwise be there. But, of course, plasticity can also make things worse um, and, and, and put populations further away and create a, a larger mismatch between the phenotype and the environment, in which case there's even stronger directional selection, and so the, the risk of extinction goes up even more. We can kind of visualize, I think, these various scenarios um, uh, in this way. So we can imagine, for example, two environments uh, that have two different optimal phenotypes shown in these black circles. And if, if there was perfect plasticity, if you could move one genotype to one environment or the other, and they could produce the optimum in both cases, um, the, this scenario should result in no evolutionary change because you would be at the optimum in, in both environments, and so you would experience presumably stabilizing selection in both cases. It's very rare that we see that in most traits. More often what we see is something like this, where you move these genotypes to this environment, um, there's a plastic response, so the direction of plasticity is adaptive. You're, you're on average closer to the new optimum with plasticity than you are without it. But some genotypes do better than others. And so there's, a, there's still an opportunity here for directional selection to act and move the population to, to the new optimum. And so across time, just from that standing variation, we'd expect a shift in the, in the uh, average slope of the reaction norm. And this has been modeled by um, various people, including recently by, by Russ Landy. As a consequence, you know, you get closer and closer to the new optimum, the strength of selection should also uh, uh, become weaker. Alternatively, you can imagine the, another scenario where you don't want to be sensitive to the environment. Plasticity is bad. Um, you want to maintain maybe an optimal body size, an optimal body temperature, some optimal phenotype across uh, a range of environments. And here, plasticity now is something that you need to overcome. It takes you away from the optimum. And selection is about evolving to get back to where you were. And again, we can imagine where um, across generations, you get closer and you, you come back to that, to that optimum. So um, if, we look at the, if we look at theory and empirical studies, um, we know that when we think about plasticity, there's, there's, no, one, there's no one way in which, po in which the way that a population is plastic um, will predict necessarily how it will evolve. There, and I think the talks today have certainly illustrated the diversity of ways in which um, organisms are, are plastic and how they deal with their environments. And so we know that there's <clears throat> um, adaptive plasticity. We know that there's rapid evolution. But what we really lack is um, uh, the ability to sort of focus in and go to a population in nature and really capture what happens during the very early stages when populations are diverging. Often we're, we're taking retrospective perspectives and looking back and saying, we know these populations are adapted to different environments. We can measure their plasticity and we can infer whether that plasticity is adaptive or not. But it's very, very, it's been very rare that we can actually capture in nature the role that plasticity is playing as the populations diverge, which in some ways is, is kind of disappointing, thinking um, as, many, as much work as has been done that, that we really lack those kinds of examples. So what I want to talk about now is, is an example where we've, we've attempted to actually capture that, that role of plasticity in the early stages of, of, of evolutionary divergence using Trinidadian guppies as a, as a model system. And so this is a, a, um, a part of a collaborative uh, project where we are using guppies and, and a, a, an experimental evolution approach in the wild and asking, given a known source population, um, what are the patterns of plasticity in the source population? And does that predict the kinds of evolutionary changes that we see in newly established populations. So we can compare the ancestral state to the derived state on a very, very um, 
kind of controlled and known time scale. So why, why guppies? Well, um, there's been a lot of work uh, by a lot of people on Trinidadian guppies going back to the 1950s. Uh, Carl Haskins, John Endler, Dave Resnick, Ann McGurin, and others have, have really elevated the system as a, as a model system for studying adaptation in the wild. And most of the focus has been on comparing nearby populations that either occur with or without predators. And so within a drainage, within a stream, low, low sort of lowland populations occur in complex communities where guppies are essentially, sadly, nothing more than food for big fish. But you can move upstream into these more simple tributaries, and there guppies occur uh, by themselves or with only one other species, and they live essentially without these predators. And almost every phenotype that we've looked at differs between these populations color patterns, morphology, physiology, behavior, the list, every, anything you look at almost is, is different. Um, so we know, and we know these phenotypic differences occur parallel and independently across multiple drainages. And common garden experiments and now increasingly uh, population genetic studies are showing that there's a genetic basis to these, to these differences and that they, they can rapidly occur within you know, a few years of, of, of moving from a, a high predation to a low predation environment. So they're model systems for studying adaptation in nature. That also makes them model systems for asking, what role is plasticity playing in this, in this uh, adaptation? So I know it's kind of a little bit cold and windy outside, so um, I'm going to take you to Trinidad real quick and kind of give you a sense of what these environments actually look like. So. Downstream and in, in the larger, larger rivers where, where we work, um, you go underwater and you see these are some kerosens, kind of piranha relatives. There's a pike cichlid there moving. Whoops. Oops. <laughs> I think I... Let me start over. Uh, so we use these butterfly nets to uh, catch the fish, an entomologist like that. Um, so here's, these are some kerosens. Hiding in the back there is the pike cichlid, which has been referred to as a guppy specialist. They're swimming away. What you don't see are any guppies, um, because they're all in the stomachs of these bigger fish or hiding uh, under the rocks. But if you move upstream and you move further sort of into the forest, the streams get smaller. You move into these little tributaries, and you move above these sort of little barrier waterfalls that exclude the bigger fish. And once you get above them, then, oh, here are the guppies. And now they're super abundant. There's a little rivulus, a little killifish, that's not, which is a, a more minor predator of, of baby guppies. Um, these guppies seem happy as clams, uh, swimming around, having a good time, not worrying about getting eaten. And so we, we contrast these high and low predation populations um, but I think it's important to also recognize that um, there's a lot more going on here than just predation. And so although I, I focus on the predator effect, I also want to emphasize that these environments are multivariate and they differ in lots of ways. So the high predation streams, for example, are larger rivers with open canopies above them. There's a lot more sunlight that comes down, so there's much more primary production to support these more complex communities. Those complex communities of larger fish result in higher predation, but that also keeps guppy densities much lower. And so uh, there's very little uh, intraspecific competition, very little evidence for any kind of density-dependent effects. Um, and there's also uh, a <clears throat> the abiotic environment is also much more stable in terms of the, the flow of water through the system. Whoops. When you get up to the low predation sites, the canopies close over these smaller streams. There's much less primary production. Uh, food quality is, is more poor. The, um, the reduced predation results in much higher densities of guppies, so it's a, it's a much more competitive environment, a, a higher density of guppies. The flow regime is more slow and stable, or slow but less stable and more subject to flash flooding which occasionally resets the system and flushes the guppies out, and that's why they're constantly being, um, well, not constantly, but 
but get eventually recolonized. So moving from the high predation sites, which is sort of the ancestral state, to the low predation site involves more changes than just the predation regime. Uh, there's lots of other things going on as well. So um, a few years ago, in collaboration with, with David Resnick, um, we did a series of uh, experimental transplants of guppies from a, a high predation site, shown here on the, uh, as a red dot. And within the same drainage system, we, we moved guppies uh, in the first year to two streams where, where guppies were um, absent. And then in the following year, a second set of introductions uh, to upper parts of, of two more tributaries where guppies were also absent. And so we can compare the, the, the source population to these uh, newly established low predation populations and still compare them to these uh, existing populations in green that have been coexisting with, um, uh, without predators for, for much longer time periods. Now, since these introductions, which started in 2008, um, I think this is perhaps the largest uh, continuous mark recapture experiment that I think has been going on in ecology since. So every month, post-introduction, a crew of field assistants goes out to these streams, collects every single individual in each, in each one of these experimental streams, brings them back into a lab, photographs them, takes a, a fin sample for DNA, gives them a unique combination of color tattoo marks, so in the case way, the same way that bird people put color bands on birds to identify them individually, and then returns them to their exact same spot. And this has been going on now for, for, for many years. I haven't been as directly involved with this. My role in the project has been every year since the introduction, um, at least for the five years after the introductions, was to collect fish from the introduction sites and the source population, bring them back into the lab, and rear them in laboratory common gardens. And so these are, this is sort of a picture of our common garden setup. It's a recirculating system. And what we, what we do is we, we take the wild caught individuals, we generate family lines, uh, we breed them in the lab for two generations, and then we take full sibs uh, from the second generation of lab born fish and put them into two uh, treatments, either one where they're exposed to predator cues or one where they're exposed to plain, plain water. And so um, what are these predator cues? Well, we essentially put a pike cichlid into the sump tank that's in the water supply, and we feed that pike cichlid guppies. And um, the fish never actually see the predators, um, but we know that there's uh, chemical cues that are given off by the predators that have a strong effect on guppies. And these chemical cues come from the guppies themselves, so they have, within their, within their skin, within their epidermis, they have these specialized club cells. When those club cells break open, they release a chemical, a pheromone. If you isolate that and inject it into the water, guppies freak out because they know somebody just got eaten. Um, and then the, the predator itself uh, has caramones and chemicals that, it, that are contained within the slime layer on the outside. And we've done some experiments where we've, we've had siblings essentially side by side, swimming happily, and then we've introduced the pike cichlid into the sump tank. And within about five minutes, all of the fish that are in that water supply migrate to the top of the water column they retreat back to the top of the tank and curl up and look as if they're afraid for their lives, even though there is no visual cue around. And we've shown now in a series of papers that just the presence of this chemical cue induces a whole series of, of plastic responses in a, in a wide diversity of, of traits. So we can mimic the ancestral environment of the predator and the derived environment in the absence of the predator. Uh, just by putting a guppy in, or a, a cichlid into into the water supply, and so then we can we can use sort of basic uh, general linear models, uh, much in the way that been described earlier today, to to look at uh, full sibs, to look at the pattern of uh, plasticity across different environments. We can look at 
um, population effects to get the sort of evolutionary change, and we can look at the kinds of interactions that arrive from that. And we've looked at a number of different traits. I'm just going to focus on a few today um, and, and kind of summarize some of the interesting results. The, the first result I want to talk about is um, a, a trait that I, I said earlier that there aren't many traits that show perfect plasticity. This might be one of them. So this is, this is something that uh, one of my former students, uh, Julian Torres Dodal, looked at, which is the, um, the behavioral response to the presence of a predator. And so this, it seems that even in the wild, but also in the lab, when you expose guppies to these predator cues, they move to the surface. Every population that we've looked at does the exact same thing. They all show the same plastic response, and there's no population divergence. So here's an example, perhaps, of a, of a very perfect plastic response that may prevent evolutionary change, because everybody does the exact same thing. And there's maybe no opportunity for directional selection to cause differences between high and, and low predation populations. So this would be adaptive plasticity. Um, alternatively, we've looked at um, growth rates. So this is work done by another student, Corey Handelsman. So if we look at the growth rate of high predation fish and low predation fish in the um, absence of the queue and in the presence of the queue, you see this type of pattern. So if you take the source population and you compare it to the low predation sort of control, um, much faster growth rate. But if you, if you take away the cue, and so essentially you move the high predation fish and mimic the low predation environment, it actually grows uh, faster. Sorry, I think I went the other way. It actually grows, um, if, you, if you take away the cue, it grows, um, uh, let's see, <laughs> here we go. Okay, so when you rear without the cue, um, they grow fast. So, this is a, a plastic response. So plasticity makes them grow even faster. But the evolutionary response is to grow slower. So here's an example where plasticity and evolution run counter to one another. So this would be non-adaptive or counter gradient. So the plastic response is to grow fast. The evolutionary response is to grow slow. So what do the what do the introduction populations do? Does, do, they, do they retain sort of their high predation um, plastic response and grow faster, or do they evolve to grow slower? They, within two years, six to eight generations, they rapidly evolve lower, slower growth. So these are, all of these lines represent the four introduction populations. These are reaction norms that are essentially this genotype in this environment for six to eight generations. So growth rate evolves very rapidly, and the slopes of the, of the reaction norms, the plasticity itself, also evolves very rapidly. So here's a case where if we contrast this with the, with the behavioral results that I showed you initially, adaptive plasticity is not evolving at all. Non-adaptive plasticity, or this counter gradient response, is um, evolving very rapidly. And that might be because selection is acting much more strongly because the phenotypes are basically further from the optimum. They, they plastically respond by growing faster when they should be growing more slowly. I could go on and on with lots of other examples, but I can summarize by just saying that for a lot of traits that we've looked at so far, um, most show adaptive plasticity and only a few show non-adaptive plasticity. So we know some of these traits evolve very quickly, some evolve more slowly. These all evolve very fast. And so it's possible that um, the way in which populations are plastic is changing the strength of selection with these non-adaptive responses subject to stronger selection than some of the adaptive ones. But we've only looked at just essentially a handful of traits so far. And so this is still uh, work in progress. But I'll come back to this point later. What about trait correlations? These are all, all so far, all of these traits that we've looked at so far, we've looked at in isolation. 
but we know traits aren't independent. And so we wanted another phenotype that we could look at that sort of captures more of the um, multivariate aspect of, of integration and trait correlations. And for that, we looked at body shape. So we know that predators exert strong selection on body shape, especially in live-bearing fish. And body shape is an inherently complex multivariate trait. And so we're really interested now you know, it, it, on, on focusing on the patterns of covariance and, and correlation across traits. And so to do this, we used uh, geometric morphometrics. And so this is also, again, work by uh, 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 Corey Handelsman, uh, who just finished in my lab, and asked, basically, how plastic are the uh, patterns of trait correlations and how quickly do they evolve? So we know if we, can, if we survey high and low predation populations across many different streams, uh, there's a very consistent difference in shape. The low predation fish are deeper bodied. They have a slightly shorter caudal peduncle. And relative to the high predation fish, the position of the eye relative to the tip of the mouth is more in line. Whereas the high predation fish, which, which tend to surf, uh, forage more at the surface, the eye is below the tip of the rostrum. And so they have kind of a more upturned mouth. If you bring the fish into a common garden and do uh, a common garden breeding experiment, you find that most of these uh, changes are retained, suggesting that it's, uh, there's a, a genetic basis to these differences. So we wanted to know how body shape changes and how the correlation among traits changes um, during the very initial periods after the guppies were introduced into these new environments. So we focused on just the first year. And the first thing we noticed was the guppies got big really fast. So here are the two sets of introductions. And here is the starting body size for the source population. And what these points show is the month monthly surveys of the introduction fish. And this is a comparison with existing low predation, naturally occurring low predation populations. So you can see in both sets of introductions, there's a really rapid change in body size. So here measured as centroid size. And they get kind of almost halfway to, to, to where they presumably want to go based on just, um, just, just on size alone. What about shape? Well. When we looked at the introduction fish, we saw something that was kind of predictable, but also something that was unusual. So most of the features of, of body shape seemed to be very adaptive, meaning that these fish were becoming, appeared more low predation-like. The, um, the position of the eye relative to the tip of the mouth became sort of more similar. Um, but there was also, they became deeper, but there was also something unusual in that the, the fish got longer. And, and that was sort of opposite. We expected them to get a little bit shorter in the, in the caudal peduncle region. And this was seen in both sets of introductions. So when we looked at the pattern of trait correlations, now this would just be the phenotypic correlations in the wild. Um, here is the high predation source, and here are the low predation, uh, naturally occurring low predation populations. So we figured the introduction fish should be somewhere intermediate between here. But what we found is that they're occupying this sort of trait space, this pattern of correlation, trait correlation that's, that's very novel. And in fact, you can see that the reason why they're getting longer, they're sort of moving along this, this axis that is, for, for a given body depth, making them much longer. So they can't get because of the way that the traits are correlated, they can't get uh, deeper without getting slightly longer at the same time. And we see this in both, in both population, both sets of introductions. So this is, this is what selection is actually seeing, um, a, a rearrangement of the pattern of trait correlations. And, and this is all within the very first few months of the introduction. So this is clearly a plastic response. So we see a mixing up of the pattern of trait correlations that selection is acting on. The question is, does that matter for the evolutionary response? 
to change this sort of matrix. And so we brought them into the lab. We conducted a common garden experiment. And <laughs> again, we find some results that we expect and some things that we didn't expect. So the first thing that we, we saw that caught our attention was that despite being longer in the field, um, in the lab, they're actually getting slightly, slightly shorter. And these changes may seem subtle, but they're actually significant. They're also deeper, as we'd expect. But in the wild, we saw the, the mouth go down. But when we raised them in the common garden, the mouth became even more extreme in its upward orientation, which is exactly opposite to the way they should have evolved. So why did they evolve in the wrong direction? Well, now these are this is this these matrix are based on on the full sib families where we're controlling for the environment, and this is the the source and the derived population. Here's where the introduction populations lie. The, the whole matrix is now orthogonal to the ancestral state. Now, whether this happened because of a, of a founder effect or drift, or whether selection has actually shaped this, um, we, we don't know. But we can explain now this, this, this change in the position of the mouth uh, because of the way that the traits are correlated. You essentially can't get deeper without changing the orientation of the mouth. So we're tracking this to see how this will change over time. So um, plasticity can change trait correlations. This potentially has consequences for the evolutionary response. Uh, but this is, I think, a really wide open area that needs to be sort of investigated more before we can make any kind of broader generalizations. OK, I want to end with. Um, now talking about gene expression. So this is work in collaboration with Kim Hoke at Colorado State and um, Kim Hughes, the two Kims. I just can say Kims when I email them. Um, looking at basically the same approach, uh, but now rather than just looking at one trait here or there, looking at uh, patterns of transcriptomic changes in the brain, looking at changes in gene expression. So after the first year, in the common, we, we looked at the fish in the common garden. We took out brains. We measured gene expression of the source population, of the introduction populations, and the naturally occurring low predation populations, just to get a baseline. The expectation was that there shouldn't be much change after only a, a single year. But then we found this. So <clears throat> for over 37,000 transcripts, Here's our high predation source population. Here are the two introductions. And here is a naturally occurring low predation population. So in only three to four generations, we see a complete change in the pattern of gene expression within the brains. So really rapid evolutionary change. Most of these are on PC2, on this principal component axis. And you can see that everything on PC1 separates the naturally occurring low from the naturally occurring high and, and from the introduction population. So there's the main axis that separates these populations is not evolving. It's, it's what's loading on the second axis. So if we take the top 500 transcripts that load on PC2 and plot them for the, for the two introduction populations in terms of uh, Haldanes, which is a measure of evolutionary change, um, we get Haldanes. Some of these Haldanes are um, the highest rates of evolution observed for any natural population. So very rapid change. The problem is, you know, we only introduced approximately 150 fish across these, these, these two drainages and so uh, two streams. So some of this could reflect a, a bottleneck, a founder effect, and the effects of drift. So we really wanted to hone in on the subset of these genes that we thought were under directional selection, that actually evolved in parallel in the two populations. And so we, we focused on uh, that subset that showed parallel changes in the same direction towards the low predation population in both introduction sites. So those uh, 37,000 genes get reduced down to just uh, uh, 135. And so we have. Uh, 
these genes that are now showing constitutive differences in expression in a common garden are evidence that they've, they've evolved. They appear to have done so in parallel. Um, these changes based on various tests could not be explained by drift alone. And so, so this is our, our subset of rapidly evolving genes. And I think uh, there was a slide earlier today that looked very similar to this. And so we used our same approach we, as, as we would for any other trait. We asked what's the pattern of plasticity in gene expression for a given transcript in the source population, so in the presence of the Q and in the absence of the Q. And, and ask, basically, compared to the introduction populations, is the direction in the opposite direction? So if, if plasticity is to decrease expression, but evolution is to increase, so the minus and the plus, um, are, is, there an op, is, it, is it this sort of opposite, non-adaptive counter-gradient pattern? Or are they more in line with one another? Um, so in this case, reduction plastically and a reduction in an evolutionary sense. And we can sort of plot this as um, uh, in this way where we look at the direction of plasticity versus the direction of evolution. If the, if the relationship occupies these two quadrants, it should be, it we would interpret that as adaptive plasticity, that the direction is in the same direction as, uh, as evolution, or non-adaptive, it's in the opposite direction. What did we find? When we look at the pattern of plasticity in these rapidly evolving genes, they mostly show a non-adaptive pattern, so similar to, the, to what we saw earlier today. Um, and this, this pattern is, this correlation is much greater than you would expect given the underlying structure of the data using a permutation test. So our interpretation of this is that um, non-adaptive plasticity, again, is resulting in stronger directional selection. There's a more of a mismatch causing stronger selection on, on these genes compared to uh, everything else. Of course, these genes are not fully independent of one another. And so we've, we've, if, we, if you look at the, um, if you do a uh, weighted uh, uh, correlation network analysis to look at the distribution uh, of these changes, they're distributed across many modules, suggesting that there's probably multiple um, regulatory changes that underlie these, these uh, evolved responses. And if you do the annotation, what you find is that most of these genes seem to be involved in, in uh, metabolism and general sort of um, homeostatic, I would say, function. And, and so part of, part of, I think, what What's, what's going on here is you move into a new environment and it throws you off of your, your optimum. And a lot of what is rapidly evolving is basically bringing you back to, to that optimum. So plasticity is bad <laughs> in this initial sense and selection and evolution are trying to recover what was there before. And I think we see that in that if you compare the magnitude of plasticity in the source population versus the uh, introduction populations, there's also rapid evolution for reduced plasticity. Now, these are, this is only focusing on, the, on those genes that we say have rapidly evolved. But there's another part to the story, which is that the, the number of genes that are significantly plastic but have not evolved um, only overlap slightly with those that we say um, are significantly evolved. So the short-term plastic response to the presence and absence of predators involves largely a different set of genes than the, the, the cross-generation evolved response, suggesting that there may be two different systems, which is also a theme that I think came up uh, earlier today. And so, but what's interesting is if we just focus on these guys, so these are not significantly evolved, but they're significantly plastic, and we ask how are these transcripts diverging during the early stages of evolution, we actually see a very similar pattern. That the relationship between uh, plasticity and divergence, um, tend, there's more divergence occurring when with, with plasticity in the wrong direction. So <clears throat> to summarize, gene expression can be treated like any other kind of trait transcript number, um, 
It can rapidly evolve. What's rapidly evolving initially seems to be transcripts that are showing the sort of non-adaptive response that we interpret as, as them being under much stronger selection. But it's not necessarily that these, are, these genes are making the fish bigger or more colorful. It may be all the stuff that's under the hood. Um, it's, all, it's about sort of maybe finding a new sort of set of homeostatic controls in this new environment. Um, and I think the, the, the sort of the future lies in kind of comparing these um, short-term versus long-term set of genes and, and looking at how they, how they sort of behave um, as these populations evolve and become more adapted to these, to these environments. So I wanted to just put up a study slide of my favorite uh, Western movie, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, as a sort of a euphemism for, um, uh, for uh, how I'm, I think I view plasticity and evolution these days. And so this is just meant to be sort of the fisher or kind of geometric model where you have some optimum. But instead of thinking about mutation, thinking about plasticity. And you can imagine that perfectly plastic organisms can move um, and occupy a new, a new uh, optimum through plasticity alone. That should expose them more to stabilizing selection. That should result in a very slow rate of adaptation. So genes and traits that sort of exhibit these patterns should be the slowest evolving. Um, there should also be uh, some that are adaptive, but maybe not perfectly adaptive, uh, where there's still some opportunity for directional selection to operate. Uh, these might evolve at maybe intermediate rates of, of, of change and um, of evolution. They're also beneficial in an ecological sense that they help you get closer to that new optimum. And then there's everything else, this non-adaptive response that I mean, I, I should have maybe put another line that takes you way over here that overshoots the optimum. But here, plasticity is taking you further from the optimum. And as a result, there's a strong antagonistic selection to overcome that plasticity. And, and these should be perhaps the, the traits that we, we focus on for maybe evolving uh, most rapidly. These are the ones that we would sort of maybe focus in on if, if you were interested in evolutionary rescue. But I think the take home message of all of this is that when you look at a whole organism, they're made up of many traits, whether it be at the transcriptome level or at the phenotypic level. And it's likely that all of these things are going on all at the same time. And so how all of, the, this type, all of these types of plasticity contribute to local adaptation and evolutionary change is likely to be sort of a net kind of effect of, of, a, of the collective response. And that, that's a very challenging sort of multivariate problem that I don't think anybody has yet fully figured out, because it's very hard to assign fitness to these types of, of responses. So with that, I'd just like to thank um, a large number of people for all the help. This is clearly a collaborative uh, effort, NSF for funding, and um, thanks for listening. Well, I think that's, that's actually similar to what I'm thinking. Um, and, and we don't have good mortality data. So um, with the transcriptome data, my interpretation of those results is that um, given the, the large number of what we're calling non-adaptive is just because they're going in the opposite direction that they evolve. So it's, it's sort of an implicit um, assumption that we're making. But I have to think that those individual transcripts are probably only weakly correlated with fitness. Because you know, if, if each one was very strongly correlated with fitness, and you did 135 traits did the wrong thing in a new environment, and they were all strongly correlated with fitness, that sounds like a recipe for extinction. <laughs>
Um, so I think you know we're far, far enough away from from fitness and from phenotypes that are at least more correlated with fitness that you can kind of get these you can get strong selection without the the mortality or demographic cost of that of that strong selection. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of a pattern, you may have a situation where it's quality of treatment is changing, the spin frame gets larger, and that could get you through a, a tight period, but then the, the more efficient thing is maybe to find that which is smaller. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I think, I think we can answer that question more sort of concretely as we, we follow these populations. So we're looking at now what those longer chain longer term changes are, and we can then compare them over time across like two years, three years, four years, five years, and just see how different is the long term solution relative to the short one. But it, given that they're largely non-overlapping sets of genes, it already suggests that there are two different solutions to that problem, the short term versus the long term. Does anyone have a question to start us off? One common theme that came up throughout these talks was the concept of risk, both how plasticity can help you modulate risk and also how it might result in risk in terms of whether you're able to match this a potential new environment. And I'm wondering if um, you could comment from your different perspectives on whether there might be some common themes or rules or theories that we could use to understand how an organism's evolutionary past and biology might constrain that risk. give my best shot. Okay, so um, I come from uh, uh, a hardcore sort of developmental genetic background, and um, so I don't think about these questions in the same way that the others on the panel do. Um, but one thing that has come to my attention you know, during my studies is that it seems to be the case that organismal systems are inherently fairly robust. Um, when you expose an organism to a stressor, whether this be, um, you know, for instance, uh, fluctuating temperature conditions or the absence of microbiota, developmental systems, although they may not perform optimally, they don't seem to just fall apart. Right? The organism doesn't just die. Um, <clears throat> so I think um, from my perspective, what, what I'm really interested in is understanding how it is that developmental systems are able to maintain this robustness. Um, and on the one hand, I think this may be underlain by uh, plasticity. And so one of the things that, you know, there's, there's often this distinction made between robustness and plasticity in development and evolution, but really they're just the same coin, just different sides. In order to maintain a robust response, you must have plasticity in gene expression that underlies that response and vice versa. Um, so I'm very curious about this, um, how organisms maintain those, those plastic repertoires that allow them to maintain robust phenotypes, as well as the ways in which developmental systems can respond and integrate adaptive responses to novel environments. And I think the theory of facilitated variation, for those who are curious about this, uh, provides a good amount of answers in, in that regard. And um, I would add, you know, overall, 
I would say that you know what we see over and over in theoretical work is you want to minimize risk in a way. You want to minimize between generations fluctuations in fitness. And so in order to accomplish that, sometimes you need to increase variation within a generation to minimize between generation variation in fitness. And you can do that through a wide variety of strategies from this type of stochastic change that I mentioned to some organisms um, employ more uh, sensing type of strategies um, and so on. And um, for a lot of these things, what we see repeatedly, I think, are strategies that um, may not confer a benefit to any one individual in particular, but overall, they are helpful for the lineage. So I work on extinct organisms, and I think a lot about the patterns that we see over time where uh, you have high rates of speciation in some line lineages, and they tend to be the ones that go extinct, and then you have these other lineages that don't seem to do very much, but they stick around for a long time. And I'm wondering if the rates of plasticity, the... Uh, could be applied to that level of thinking. Is there something, so are your organisms that have more plasticity in more traits more likely to be those lineages that stay alive through evolutionary time? Do you have a sense of how much plasticity varies across species and across big groups of species? Does that make sense? <laughs> um, well, so we, we uh, in terms of aphids, think about our post-plant adapted biotypes, depending on your opinions on sympatric speciation as kind of undergoing a process of speciation. And so um, I, we were excited that um, they were that variable in terms of their plastic response because it gave us kind of an opportunity to see how um, plasticity might be facilitating kind of the adaptation of those groups to their new environment. And so I don't have an answer for you yet, but that's certainly something that we're interested in, in thinking about in terms of, you know, if these species are in fact undergoing a process of speciation, does extreme plasticity play a role in that? But I mean, we're only looking at one trait. I mean, we, we all get to study much, many more plastic traits together. So it's kind of I would just quickly add that, you know, I would look, if I were you, I would sort of try to look. Some people have tried to link plasticity to um, generalists versus specialists. So I would sort of look at that literature of trying to understand when would you want to evolve a generalist phenotype versus more of these types of specialists that only do well in certain environments and would perish <coughs> otherwise. that so so the question is why do why do low predation guppies have slower growth yeah. um, I think it's part of a it's just part of the general sort of life history syndrome that um, in in high predation environments with high mortality you have a much more of a sort of a live fast die young kind of uh, strategy where you grow very quickly you mature at a small age and size and you start to reproduce before you get eaten. Uh, in the low predation environments, it's a more competitive environment. And so maturing at a very small, growing fast and maturing at a small size is actually disadvantageous. So you're at a, at a disadvantage, and it's, it's better to delay maturity, grow more slowly, um, and be a sort of a more robust individual in order to sort of maintain your competitiveness within that high density environment. Does that make sense? So, so if they mature later, um, would the fitness be lower? Or if you compare two genotypes in the low predation environment? Yeah, so that, that's sort of a, it's kind of a different, uh, different question than what I was interested in. But yes, um, 
on one hand, you could ask uh, another way of saying that is why do you see the evolution of a low predation life history? Because maturing earlier should always, and, and reproducing earlier should always be, uh, you know, have a fitness advantage. Uh, but actually, that turns out not to be the case under high density. And uh, at, under high density conditions, maturing early actually puts, puts you at a fitness disadvantage. And um, there's work by um, Ron Basser, who's done a series of uh, mesocosm type experiments uh, that, that show that effect very clearly. Because, because the fecundity is lower if you mature early or? Um, because basically you're, if you mature early, you're very small and you basically get outcompeted by larger individuals. And so you, you don't get as much food, you have lower fecundity, you have lower um, survival. Okay, so the second question I have is, is your interpretation of the relationship between plasticity and, uh, and adaptation. You were saying the plasticity kind of a strengthened, it because it's in the opposite direction of adaptation, it strengthened the selection. Strengthening selection, yes. So, so in a way you're, so, so I don't know whether you're, you're thinking that it, in order to strengthen the selection, the plasticity goes the opposite direction, or it's just a natural consequence. The st strengthening of selection is just a natural consequence of the opposite direction of plasticity. Um, I'm not sure I, I'm, I'm following your question. So is it that... Um, because, okay, so... So if the, if the adaptation is to go higher, for example, in expression, and the plasticity, for whatever reason, it happens to go the low expression, then of course the natural consequence is selection is stronger. Are you, are you saying that? Yes. Okay, because, because the other possibility is that there is a purpose for, for making the selection stronger, and for that purpose, the, 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 the plasticity goes to the low end. You're not saying the other, the second one. Yeah, well, I, I think I lean towards the first interpretation just because I, I guess my, my thinking is that um, if you move into an environment where there's never been an opportunity for selection to act, by chance, some things, some traits may go in the right direction, but many will go in the, in the, in the wrong direction, let's say. And so um, that's what creates, that's where the opportunity for selection to sort of shape the patterns of plasticity come from. And so I, I don't know that there would be any reason to sort of, unless there was some history of uh, sort of phenotypic memory or history of plasticity with and without predators, that, that these populations would be just pre-adapted to show uh, an adaptive response. So I, I think that you're just seeing variation. Most of it is in the wrong direction and that's what selection sees, uh, acts most strongly on initially. Okay. Possibility this morning um, in talking about the difference between uh, sort of the gene being maladapted classically, which is I think what the situation you're describing, and sort of the possibility that given that you're not well adapted to the current condition, sort of invoking some kind of a stress response Oh, I yeah. So so that that's certainly that's certainly uh, I think a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I should. But I think the the question is, um, what are the consequences for the strength of selection then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we're also seeing the evolution of reduced plasticity in those same transcripts over time. So if they were conferring some sort of best of a bad situation. Why would they not? Why wouldn't they be retained? And why? Why are they? Why is that the magnitude of plasticity decreasing? It suggests that plasticity itself is also under selection. But again, you know, when you're dealing with these kinds of data and you're very far away from knowing the exact pathways that they're involved in and 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 the traits that they're influencing, I think it's it is a little bit open to speculation. First, I'd like to express my appreciation for everybody on the panel for a very uh, edifying um, 
day today. Uh, this question might or might not be related to uh, phenotypic plasticity, and I want to specifically address the question to Dr. Kaja. If I understand that cancer cells basically come from our, the host own cells with uncontrolled growth, what exactly is the evolutionary benefit of the cancer cells and to whom? Um, you know, I think sort of turning the question back a little bit, um, maybe you can ask the question, why isn't there, um, for example, let's take something like breast cancer, right? Why don't we see selection against it? If it kills people, why don't we see selection against it? Well, the reason why we don't see selection against it is because oftentimes, if you look at incidence rates of cancer, oftentimes they happen uh, post-reproduction. And so we don't see selection against it is because it kills people bef after they reproduced. And so they were able to sort of pass the, their genes to their offspring um, and so that's one of the reasons why, you know, uh, we can't say there's selection against tumors. And the reason, you know, it, you know, tumors are essentially, mis the way I view them, I mean, I'm sure a cancer biologist would be much better equipped to answer this question, but the way I view them is, um, uh, you know, a series of mistakes that happen, a series of steps that happen in a cell, and one of them, a, a, a enough accumulation of these mistakes sometimes give a, gives a certain cell an evolutionary benefit. And really, if you wait long enough, and if you look at, if you try to sort of map some probability of getting one of these cells um, as you age, as individuals age, and look at incidence rates, all, you know, the probability goes to one as we increase sort of the age of the individual. So if we were to live longer, X number of hundreds of years, we would all end up getting cancer. But it's not selected against in the population because we're mo mo more, most often able to reproduce before it, and so it doesn't, it's, it's an actively selected um, this may be a silly question, but bear with me. Um, so um, mo much of the focus has been on uh, individual species uh, and developmental robustness and plasticity and everything else. But in biology, we have uh, species interact, form natural communities, and we have emergent properties. And if we look around and we ask ourselves, what are the, what's the biological equivalent of cancer? So it's essentially environmental degradation. And we could take an example like um, uh, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, where, where uh, global warming is threatening its very existence. Um, are there any principles you, you can take, either from theory or from practice, from your individual case studies, that you can scale them up to ecosystems and could look at, at those phenomena in terms of plasticity and robustness of, of biological communities uh, over the next, say, 100 years? I've thought a little bit about this in terms of um, uh, emergent properties of social groups, you know, so we have honeybees living in a colony and they're uh, sort of behaving together. And one, I didn't talk about this work, but one kind of interesting um, thing I found recently is um, you can have differences in, in tendency of behavior, um, but that can be masked depending on environmental context. And so depending on, you, you can take, you know, two sets of honeybees with very different histories up until a certain point in time and then combine them together. Um, and depending on that group composition, you may express, you may see different behaviors expressed depending on that uh, sort of current social group. Um, so I think one idea may be um, sort of some levels of cryptic variation or cryptic plasticity across species that you may not recognize until you see something like maybe environmental degradation that changes some of the fundamental makeup of that community. That would be, um, uh, I think, kind of maybe an interesting parallel 
So I think, you know, um, I, I think it's a very interesting question uh, in terms of uh, scaling up the plastic responses of, of individual players within a community up to levels of ecosystems. And it's not something that really has been, I think, given a lot of uh, attention, but I think there's increasingly uh, different number, different groups that are kind of looking at, for example, um, ecosystem effects of like different different genotypes or the plastic responses in terms of say like nitrogen excretion and how that uh, plays a role. So like with the guppies, we know that there's a whole other separate group that is looking at the sort of ecosystem consequences of these introductions. So as the guppies are evolving, uh, they're excreting nitrogen, they're consuming the invertebrates, but they're actually um, increasing the primary production within these streams. And so they have a fertilizing effect, so to speak. And so there's actually a, um, uh, a significant measurable ecosystem effect, but that also changes as they evolve and adapt. And, and so part of like becoming a, a locally adapted, low predation guppy is intimately related to those sort of ecosystem functions that, that, also, that they also play. And so, you know, as whole ecosystems experience stress and um, are subject to sort of strong selection, the question I think is, you know, do, do the populations evolve in such a way that will make them more resilient to those kinds of changes? Or are we looking at some sort of non-analog community in the future that is very different from what we have today? panel. Um, I hope everyone will be able to join us for the reception in the Natural History Museum. Um, I think you can follow the crowd to get there. And for those of us who can't join us, please turn in your lanyards. There's a box right out the front. And the rest of us, we hope to see you there. And don't forget that there's going to be an after party um, after <laughs> the museum at MASH. Uh, and it's on Washington Street. All right, thank you.